I'm working with this client right now who is on the verge of retirement. And as part of their retirement, they are relocating. They're right-sizing their life, they say, to this new phase of life. Pretty exciting. I see it a lot. So this month on the Retirement Answer Man Show, we're going to explore how to relocate in retirement and come out the other side happier. Hey, welcome to the show. My name is Roger Whitney. I am your host. If you haven't been here, glad you joined us. This is the show dedicated to helping you not just simply survive retirement. We want you to rock it. So on the list of stressful things, stressful events, two things that make the top 10 almost always are retirement and moving. And I see it a lot that we couple these two things together where we're retiring and we're moving. And both of those are major life changes that have their multi-factor. There are many more changes than you initially see on the surface. So trying to navigate these two, especially in tandem, well, that can be difficult. And there are a lot of traps that you can fall into that could make it not that great of an experience. So we're going to try to help you avoid those over the next three weeks. So today we're going to start with, how do you sell your house? Next week, we're going to talk about how do you choose where you want to go so you end up in a place that you're actually happy you went to. And then lastly, we're going to talk about how do you make that successful transition. But I want to start off with selling your house. And that's what we're going to talk about today. But we can't do any of that until we have that all-important disclaimer. Time for that all-important disclaimer. So I'm going to take this serious voice here for a second. Pretty serious topic, but I'll go to my normal voice. Don't take advice from me on this show. I don't know anything about you. Don't take advice from my guests. They don't know anything about you either. But hopefully they and me have some helpful hints and education that can maybe help you make better decisions for yourself. But don't make those decisions before you talk to the people that do know you, which could be your financial advisor, your legal advisor, your tax advisor, or in this case, maybe your real estate agent. That's pretty smart, right? Well, let's go in our hot topic segment and talk about why do people even want to move in retirement? What's some of that motivation that we see? So statistically, it says that most people want to age in place. They want to age in the home that they live in right now. My wife is that way. We're in a little bit of a disagreement here. Not Nothing, <laughs> nothing earth shattering, but she wants to stay in her house and keep build the outside kitchen and all those types of things. And I'm like, man, I would love to move, go do something new, right size our life for this empty nest phase. So statistically, most people do want to age in place, but I have found in my practice anyway, working with clients, is a lot of people want to move. They want to have a change as they go through this change in retirement. So what are some of those motivations? Well, Here's the common ones I see is, the, well, the big one is downsize, right? If we think of our life in phases, when we were in college, a dorm fit that phase of life maybe. And then when we're a young adult, maybe it was renting an apartment or buying a cool studio condo or something downtown that fit that phase of life. And then you get married, you have kids, then the house in the burbs may fit that phase of life where you're trying to build the environment to raise kids and have the pool and all the other stuff. Well, retirement is a new phase of life. And a lot of times we find ourselves still having the home, the McMansion or whatever you want to call it, that worked for raising a family. And we end up with too much square footage, too much maintenance, too much taxes, all those type of things. Even maybe, you know, so one is downsizing is, you know, we want to downsize. The other is, you know, maybe you chose your home because of the school district it was in or the commute to work. Well, when you retire, the school district doesn't matter anymore. And commuting to work, nah, I don't have to do that anymore. So a lot of people will rethink, where do we want to live? That's another big reason why I see people want to relocate as they go into retirement. Another one is they want to be near the grandbabies or they want to be near their kids who may have moved and settled in a different city. I'll tell you, the kids are important, 
But, you know, by that time, we love our kids, but they're on their own. But those grandbabies can be a big pull. And I'll tell you, this also is something where you got to make sure if you're married that you're having these conversations because I've seen instances of where one party, they really wanted to be near those grandbabies and the other one didn't realize it. And that can create some conflicts that don't really get spoken as to why when they're talking about their home and everything else. And then another reason I see is just simply a more desirable location, right? They want to go to, like for me, I want to go to Franklin, Tennessee. I would love to live there because I have a lot of friends there or wherever you're trying to imagining what might be cool to go to. And sometimes we get that idea in our head and we attach certain emotions to it when really it's the emotions we want, not necessarily the location. So there's some pitfalls there. But to relocate, the first thing you got to do is figure out, well, not the first thing, but you got to sell your house, right? And there's some issues there that we're going to dive into today. How do you sell your home to maximize the value of this resource so you have capital to be able to buy a new home or buy a new home and pocket the difference, which is something I, I see a lot. But what are some of the issues with selling a house? Well, number one is by this time, you know, it could be a more dated home if you weren't consistent in keeping it up to date as time has gone on. You know, if you're like us, we're like, we're not replacing this carpet until the kids are really gone because they're a mess, especially our son, who's about to move back home after he graduates college for a brief time. And that boy, I love him to death, but he's really clumsy. So knowing that he's coming back to the house, the motivation to replace the carpet is not there. So you get the point. The home can be dated. Some of the other issues are losing your social network, losing the doctors that you have relationships if you're going to a different state or a different area. Qualifying for a mortgage can be a big one, meaning that this is something that usually happens when someone's transitioning. They want to potentially buy the new house while they still have consistent income because of how a lot of mortgage companies qualify people nowadays. You know, especially after the financial crisis, it's been, it's interesting because I've had this happen with people that were, you know, fairly wealthy where they had ample assets from a net worth standpoint to pay for the house 10 times over, but they didn't have the income to support the mortgage payment that they were applying for. So they were denied. I mean, they had a ton of money, a ton of liquid money, but they didn't have the income that the mortgage company wanted to see or the underwriter wanted to see. And so they were denied the mortgage. And so what we had to do in that situation is go to a more local mortgage company where they actually did custom underwriting. Because what ends up happening with these major mortgage companies, and I'm not an expert here, but is they just put you through a system where they score you based on all the data and there's not much human input into whether it's going to qualify or not. So this can be a consideration when you're selling your house and buying a new house is, hey, how am I going to qualify for that new house if I'm going to do a mortgage? And when we, we'll get into a little bit of that in another episode. And then choosing where you want to go. Now, I have a client that is, they literally just put their home on for sale recently. Here we go again. We have Joel So See Hi. From Stacking Benjamins, Hacking Into My Show. How you doing, Joe? Oh, I love hacking into your show. Any way we can make this better. Yes. Yes. God bless you. God bless you. But, but actually, in all seriousness, how do you beat perfection? Because this show is awesome. I just, I don't know, man. I, I always dance to the bumper music. Like People see me running down the road listening to the Retirement Answer Man and <laughs> dancing as you're changing segments. All right. Well, we have two things we got to talk about today. Yes. One is... You are one of the few, the proud, that is moving back to Detroit, Michigan. I am. When I left 10 years ago, the story was, you know, the last person out, shut off the lights. But I got to tell you, you and I have seen it. There is a lot of Silicon Valley talk around automation and vehicles. And there's, you're looking at the auto companies becoming more innovative. And that stuff is in my wheelhouse. And I'm super excited to be moving back to the city where there's so much construction, dude. If you haven't been back there lately, so much construction and that story's neat. And we're headed back. Yeah, I was downtown. I stayed downtown earlier this year and I was like, what? It's this amazing. Is, yeah. Yeah. Almost every street has cranes on it and people. And it's funny because I kind of 
hit myself in the head, like the face palm, because every year I go back and run the turkey trot because we have family in the Detroit area. And two years ago, it was flipping dead. And I thought to myself, like, you know what? I'm hearing this thing about how cheap you can buy real estate. I should buy some right down here. And I didn't do it. And then a year ago, I thought, as you saw, you know, there was evidence around the city, let's say that things were really starting to change. And this last year, I'm running the turkey trot through downtown. And you know what I said? I went, I missed it. I totally dropped the ball and I missed it. And obviously it's still fairly inexpensive. It's Detroit, but those deep, deep discounts might not be now what they were before. Well done, Mr. Financial Expert. I know. So the first thing I want to talk about is you sold your house like lickety split. And we're talking about on this episode, successfully selling a house. So, I mean, you're fresh out of it, buddy. Give us some observations from selling yours. Two things I did better this time than I did with other people. You know, we had a six month time frame, and we knew that. So we made sure that we knew what the comparable houses look like. We knew what the reasonable amount was to ask for square footage wise. I wasn't in a position because I have an agenda and I knew what day I had to move to be aggressive with the pricing, but I knew where we'd be competitive. But then, so that was step one was knowing that, you know how I knew that? I hired great help. I knew who the players were in my area and I hired the woman who is just incredible in Texarkana at selling real estate. And she sat down with me and she walked me through all these numbers. Now, I didn't just rely on her. I had to also know the stuff myself, right? So I had to do my education, but have good help in your corner and they will help you. The other thing she did was she's very Gordon Ramsay-ish about how to get our house ready. And did she, she yell told- at you? Well, you know what she said? You've been in my house, our kitchen, which was a, be- it's a beautiful house. We had a beautiful kitchen, but it had this lime green paint in the kitchen that we like. And it goes with our personality, the way we decorated the house. She goes, you got to get rid of that. And I said, oh my God, really? It makes it distinctive. She goes, yes, it does. But the thing selling your house is your windows, these huge windows. And if the attention's not on the windows and it's on that paint, it's a negative. And she was exactly right. She went around the house and did that. And we staged our house, even though we live there. And I've seen statistics as a former financial advisor, and you've seen statistics, staging your house gets you more money and it also sells the house quicker. At this point, I wasn't interested in more money. I was interested in getting it sold on time. And six month time frame, we got it sold in two days. Now we're looking at houses in the Detroit area. We already own one there, but we're making a decision. Are we going to move to that house? Are we going to buy another one? I got to tell you, if you're selling your house, stage it. We're looking at Roger, some beautiful places and people are pack rats. They just, oh my goodness. I saw pictures of people's closets I wouldn't have taken these pictures because they're just stuffed full of crap. And it makes this space, which often is a huge space, which is what they're trying to emphasize. But I can't get over the amount of crap you own. Yeah. Well, both of those things, because you know, we're humans, we're emotional beings, and you can't get past that internal feeling of lime green or a packed room. Most people don't have the vision. So internally, I don't like it is going to be their first thought which even if they love the house, they can't get past the thing that they don't like that's not even part of the house. Yeah, because I think, wow, if their stuff doesn't fit in there, how's my stuff going to fit? And realistically, when I thought about that, I have less stuff than this person has. My stuff will fit fine in this beautiful closet. But my initial gut feeling, which most people, to your point, don't get past is how's my stuff going to fit? On the staging piece, some of these things were really easy. Like we have these big windows and she said, emphasize these windows as much as you can. So we had a flower bed outside of this big window that went down the staircase where you go down to the main room in my house. Roger, like I say, you've been to my house, you know, the big, huge windows, like two story high windows, but they looked out over kind of nothing. There was a nothing flower bed. We not only worked on that flower bed, which cost us nothing, Cheryl took some rocks and put them, and Cheryl's my spouse, by the way, you're like, who the hell is Cheryl? (laughs) She took some rocks and she made them in the shape of a dragonfly in the middle of it. Cost us nothing. It was just getting a little creative about how you place the rocks amid these flowers. And it was gorgeous. And when Amy, our expert realtor came through, because we had her keep coming back every few weeks, it took us about two months to stage our house based on what she told us to do. When she came back and she saw that, she's like, that is the thing. Cost us zero and was this little focal point 
outside a window that makes people excited about the house. The cool thing is the people that bought it are getting married and they loved our house so much and they love the views from the windows, which before we started staging, wasn't much. They're having their wedding on the deck outside of our house, which is awesome. I love the fact that these cool people bought it, but I also love the fact that we staged it enough and they saw enough in it that the deck is where they want to have their wedding. Awesome. Great tips. Great tips. Now, let's talk about the, well, I guess this one's not the world tour, (laughs) the Stacking Benjamins tour, which I'm going to try to make all three. I don't know if I'm going to be able to. Oh my God. Are you really? I'm going to try to get you. So, well, you tell us about the tour. Oh, that's going to be awesome. Well, it is exciting. We've had a lot of people tell us, you included, your show, you should do live. And we've done meetups with people where we just go have a foamy beverage with fans of the show. I was just in Seattle, Philadelphia, and we were there. And in both of those locations, people said, so are you going to perform? No, I'm just here to meet you. Like, oh, but I thought you were going to do your show. So we've had people tell us that over and over. So OG, my co-host and I, we put our heads together. We're like, you know, not only can we do the dad jokes, some people say dumb dad jokes, but there's no such thing, guys. No, no. No, it is awesome. Oh, I have, a, I have a dad joke. So my, I was with my son. He was in town and I, you know, I'm a pretty hip guy. And he goes, dad, you're sort of like a hipster. All my friends think you're a hipster. I'm like, yeah, but I'm a dad. So I'm a dipster. <laughs> oh my God. And, and then it went away. And then your son's like, yeah, not so much. <laughs> Okay. Anyway, proceed. Yes. But so we realize we can do the dad jokes, but we can also, there's a bunch of visual things we can do, right? We could have mom call in. We've got my mom's neighbor, Doug, coming with us. We can have, we love introducing people to new things. We can have these opening acts, which are different podcasts that open for us in all three cities. So we are coming September 25th to Orlando. We'll be at the improv. I can't believe I'm saying that out loud, by the way, Roger. We're at the flipping improv. Because you're really not that funny. No, right? So we're going to be at the Improv. It's going to be a great show. Chris Costello from Bloom is going to be our guest co-host. And we kept telling him because he's been on our show several times and the guy's great radio. He's been in finance forever and he's very blunt about what works and what doesn't. He's going to go with us. I would say he doesn't know what he's getting into, but sadly he does. We also have TIA coming with us, which is cool. They're a great nonprofit. It's 100 years old. And you know that company was born to help teachers not be destitute. That was Andrew Carnegie's mission 100 years ago. And you could argue it really still is today. So what they're doing, they're not even going to talk about TIA. They're going to bring us, all of us that are in the room, a difference maker from every community. Because they work with really smart people. They work with people in hospitals, people that are not only physicians, but professors. They work with really smart people. And they're going to shine a light on somebody who's really helped in Orlando. Michelle Schroeder Gardner is going to be our star guest. And Roger, I think you know her. She went from completely broke and working for the man to now she makes, uh, I think, $150,000 a month and lives on a sailboat. Holy cow. Uh, Yes. And so we're going to talk about this transformation from a debt lifestyle to uh, I live the way I want. And I'm not waiting for retirement. I'm living it today, which is cool. And then two weeks later, we're going to be in Kansas City. That's October 9th. A lot of cool stuff in Kansas City. I'll just highlight one. And that is that there is a fintech festival going on at the same time. And Zach Pettit from MBKC Bank is going to come on. And he's got five fintech companies that are working on apps right now that he's going to show us what's going on behind the scenes, the guts of it during that show. That's pretty cool. Detroit, a guy that you and I know who's a native Detroiter, one of the best storytellers, Roger, you and I have heard is a guy, Shannon Kaysan. And Shannon is going to share a story on stage. And this guy has been on Snap Judgment. He's been on The Moth. He's won tons of storytelling awards. He blew me away. And I didn't know who he was at the time. Like, wow, that is I, You and I were introduced to him at the same time. And we sat there in the room and he blew both of us away. And I'm so happy that he's going to be on our stage. And if you've never heard of Shannon Kaysan, I'll give everybody just a little short story, which is he was a manager at a bank inside of a grocery store and he had a gambling problem and nobody knew it. And he saw these pallets of money that were headed for the ATM. And he thought, well, I'm just going to borrow them for a couple hours, take the money down to Motor City Casino, and I'll make more with it. What could go wrong with that? 
Yeah. And you can Google the rest of that story. He's not going to tell that one. He's coming up with a new story specifically for our show. So not just him. Of course, we're going to have Andy Hill from Marriage, Kids and Money. We'll have Kat Alford. In every city, we're going to have local financial people that you may have never heard of who you're going to learn that there's cool financial stuff going on in your town. So, And that Detroit date is October 24th. But all the dates are at stackybedjamins.com forward slash tour. It's 10 bucks. We want to make it accessible. We just want to celebrate some of the cool stuff going on in these three towns. Yeah, I know it's going to be a blast because you've been MC at FinCon for a number of years and you guys put on a show. So I'm excited about it. We try to make it a circus. And if you go to the tour page, you'll see the circus that's coming to each town. And it is, it's like a circus for money nerds. You're like, oh, cool. The trapeze, the elephants, all that stuff. Yeah. It's right. be well, great. we'll have links in the show notes in our Six Shot Saturday. So good to see you, buddy. Thanks for the tips. Well, thanks a lot, man. I appreciate you helping us get the word out. So statistically speaking, most people want to age in place or age in the home that they currently own. After doing some research on it, the vast percentage of people want to just stay where they are. I encounter a lot of people, though, in my practice when I'm working with clients, people that want to move. They want a new location. So let's explore why do people want to move in the first place? Why would somebody want to relocate in retirement? One of the major reasons I see is, well, they just want to downsize. They want to right size their life for this new phase of life. If you think of phases, you remember when you're in college, potentially, you, you know, the dorm room was fine. I could pack everything I owned in a car. And then when you graduate college, maybe you rent an apartment or you buy a cool downtown condo because that fits that phase of life. And then you get kids or you get married and you have kids well, I probably should move to the burbs. I care about the school district. I need to have room for this growing family. So you buy a house with square footage, maybe a yard, maybe a pool to fit that phase of life. And then when you're an empty nester, like my wife and I are now, the kids are coming and going as they're starting their life. And we like our house. It's finally getting cleaner now that they're gone (laughs) and you're comfortable. Well, in retirement, what I see a lot as a motivator is, wow, we got all this square footage, which means heating and cooling, yard work, maintenance, taxes. And there's a motivation of right-sizing their life to this new phase of life. So they're leaner, so they can go do the things that they want to do, travel and things like that. And they just don't need the square footage anymore. So that's a big motivator I see. Another big motivator I see for relocating in retirement is, I got to be near my kids or my grandbabies. Because as your kids start your life, maybe they settled in another state. That can be a motivator. Generally, we love our kids. But I'll tell you, it's really the grandbabies or the pending grandbabies that like I got to be near those. So that's another big motivator. The third one I'll just mention briefly is a more desirable location. If you live where you raised a family, you likely purchased that house and chose where it is based on the school district your commute to work, things like that. Well, school district doesn't matter anymore. The commute to work doesn't matter anymore. So your criteria for what is the perfect home for you is totally going to change as you retire. These are the big motivators I see. Now, some of the big issues that people face when they're going to sell their home and think about relocating is, well, if they haven't kept up with keeping their house updated, that can be a problem. You know, my in-laws, they have continually updated their home over the last 20 years, and it looks very modern. But many people don't, either because of money or time, or they're happy with what is there. So that can be an issue, depending on where you're at there. If you're relocating to another area, it could be you're going to lose your social network. You're going to lose your doctors. Those can be issues. You got to choose where this is going to be. And here's one that we'll explore on another episode. But, and this is one reason why we end up pairing these two stressful events of moving and retirement is it's if you need a mortgage, it's much better to get a mortgage while you have an income from work because of how most mortgage companies qualify people. I have run into instances with clients who had enough money from a net worth perspective to buy the house 10 times over but had difficulty and actually got rejected for a mortgage because of the stated income that they showed. Because the way most mortgage companies work, and I'm not an expert here, is they take your income and they look all your assets, they ask for you know everything, 
And they put it through a system that has very human interaction with it. It's just a you know computer system. And a lot of it's based off of income, especially after the housing crisis we had. So you literally could be like this client where you have, I could pay for this house 10 times over, but not qualify for a mortgage because you don't have the income. It's silly. And in that particular case, what we did was we went to a local mortgage company where there was some relationship and they did what's called manual underwriting to actually have a person do it and look at the person and be logical about it. But that can be a problem that puts this all into place. So those are some of the issues that we face. And I was having a conversation with this client recently, and I asked him to share some of his tips through his journey. He and his wife just put their house on the market, and they're very intentional people, wonderful people, but super intentional. I was like, well, some, what are some tips that you can share for this episode? And he was kind enough to, to share some. And he said, be patient with your partner, number one, is that you're on a journey together, and this can be a stressful time. So patience during any kind of stressful periods is a blessing. And he said, that's most importantly, he put that number one. And then he also suggested you think about what your vision for your sale is. Do you want to sell it quickly? Do you want to maximize the price or minimize the time on the market for timing issues? All of that's going to go into a lot of other decisions, you know, because some homeowners are looking for fixer uppers, you know, so if it's a dated house, that's okay, as long as you price it accordingly. So that's a very good tip. Number three is he said, start early because it's all going to take a lot longer than you think it's going to take. It always seems that way with any kind of home sale or fixing up. And he says, this was interesting. And this was a process I know for them. Clean the house from top to bottom as if it's going to go through an inspection and get rid of a lot of the clutter and depersonalize. Now that's a tip. We're going to have a expert in this area here in the practical planning segment. But what they ended up having to do, and he talks about it in his comments to me that he allowed me to share, was you got to depersonalize it a lot. And that can be hard because there's a lot of things that have a lot of memories attached to them from, you know, in his case, the building of the family, right? And so one tip he said was get a storage unit and declutter the house. Try to get rid of things that you're comfortable getting rid of. But if you're finding yourself having trouble from an emotional standpoint of these things that have memories, just move them to a storage unit. So you're not actually getting rid of them. You're just moving them out of the house so you can get the house prepared for sale. Because once you declutter it, then you can actually do the painting or whatever else you need to do. But that is a good stepping stone because a lot of this stuff can get really emotional as we're going through, I mean, I have boxes of art from my daughter when she was like six, seven years old. I mean, it feels horrible if you were just to get rid of that, but you can put it in a storage unit. And then the last one I'll mention that he shared is that you got to remember, this is the messy middle, right? Retirement is messy. The actual change from full-time work to pending retirement can be really messy because there are a lot of moving parts. There's not a lot of clarity and it can be scary because it's change. It's the same thing with the house. The one thing, and it's just the nature of any kind of change management, especially when they're big like this. His suggestion, you got to remember you're in the messy middle and you get to choose the lens that you use to interpret all of this craziness going on around you, right? I think of the movie Parenthood, cute movie where the dad, Steve Martin, was so stressed about all the craziness. And his wife had a much different lens that she looked through things as if it was a roller coaster to enjoy, not one to be freaked out about. So if you're going to choose to retire and move, you're really going to have to have the right lens so you can enjoy the adventure rather than get stressed and anxiety ridden. One, because it's going to be healthier for making better decisions. And two, it's going to be a lot healthier if you're married, that you two are in it together in a positive way. Because when we're under stress in a negative way, bad things can happen. So I think that was a wonderful tip. Now, in our practical planning segment, we're going to talk to a lady, Mindy Jensen from Bigger Pockets and Bigger Pockets Money Podcast about how do you sell a house? Because she wrote a book on it. So let's go do that.
So since we're kicking this off about how to sell your house, I thought I'd bring Mindy Jensen on from the Bigger Pockets podcast, the Bigger Pockets Money podcast, because early this year, she released a book on how to sell your home. In fact, that's the title, and we'll have a link to it in Six Shot Saturday in the show notes. So I want to explore with Mindy, since she's a real estate guru, how do you sell your house? So Mindy, before we even get started, you are uh, orbit in the bigger pockets empire, which is real estate investing. I do like that word empire. Yes, I am quite prevalent on the bigger pockets empire. I am the community manager. So I'm in the forums all day, every day talking about real estate and real estate investing. I co-host their bigger pockets real estate podcast. I co-host the bigger pockets money podcast, which you guys just started which we just started in January. We talk about money because that's a big question that a lot of people have. I don't know if you know this, but people sometimes aren't so comfortable talking about money with their friends. Totally, totally. And real estate is interesting. So we're going to have to have you on maybe a couple of times because I've helped clients buy rental properties or sell rental properties and evaluate whether it makes sense for them. So that's a whole nother topic. But today, what I want to talk about is how to sell your house. Because you have a book, How to Sell Your Home, And in my world, when I'm walking life with clients and they're transitioning to more independent lifestyle outside of the full-time work, a big thing that comes up is either downsizing or moving to a new location that they've had a desire to move to. So it's a transition when it comes to selling your house. And a lot of times it's the pull to go somewhere else and it's easy to forget about how important it is to sell your house in an intentional way. You know, this is a really great topic because my in-laws right now are in the process of a home sale and it's not the smoothest home sale and it's more like self-induced. They could have had a different experience, but they went out and they found a house, they put an offer on it, and then they scrambled to sell their house. So it's not going to be the smoothest transaction. It's not going to be the best experience selling a home. And it doesn't really have to be that way, especially since they didn't have to move. Right. It Um, was an option. It was the dream that they were getting pulled to and they could have taken their time. It could have been a different experience. Yeah. So let's just start from the top. And I I just have some random questions here and, and you can have framework from your book, but let's start with just the big one. Do I use someone or not? That is a really good question. That's a great place to start. And that actually, well, okay. So that's like step number two. Step number one is why are you selling? Yeah, Are you lie. moving from New York to San Diego? Then you probably, you know, for a job or something, then you probably have a specific timeline that you want to sell in. And to sell fastest, you want to use an agent to help you out because they have access to the MLS, which is the multiple listing service. That's where everybody goes to look for houses. So you as a regular non-agent person won't be able to list your house on the MLS. So you go with an agent who can do that for you. If you're just retiring, if you're selling your house and moving to San Diego because you want to, you can try to sell it by yourself. It may not be the smoothest experience, but you're also not accumulating days on market, which is once you put your house on the MLS, it starts counting up how many days has it been on the MLS. And if you're in a hot market and it's been on the market for you know 90 days, 120 days, this is a signal that there's something wrong. There may not be anything wrong with the property, but it's a signal to other agents, oh, there's probably something wrong with this property in this market. It should have sold. When you list it by yourself or it's called FSBO or for sale by owner, you're not on the MLS. So you're not gathering up these days on market and you can test out the waters if you don't have an urgent need to sell. Yeah. And a lot of it is... You know, it's like what I do. I, I'm a financial planner and I walk life with clients and I fully say, you can do a lot of this on your own. It's just a matter whether you want the organization and the intentionality and the customization. So right. I, and it is scary to try and sell this. You know, this is a huge sale. Yeah. Yeah. And a lot of times is at that stage in life, like your in-laws, you may have been in that house. That might've been the house that you raised the kids in, right? So it's been a while maybe since you've sold it. So let's approach it from this way. If I have commission dollars to spend, right, in hiring an agent, let's say, because what is it, 89% of people use an agent to sell a house? Something like that. It's a really high percentage. Yeah. So if I have commission dollars to spend, how do I spend them wisely when I choose my agent? Ah, goes back to your need to sell. Do you need to sell quickly 
then you want to get an experienced agent who has been doing this for a long time. And the reason you want to do that is they have contacts all over the local area. It's people that have bought houses from them already, people they've sold houses to, or people they've helped buy houses. Maybe they're looking to move up or down or whatever. They have a huge network that they can market your house to. They also have name recognition. So people will see, oh, in my area, Krista Coast is one of the biggest listing agents. I know that her property is going to be priced correctly because she really knows the market. I know that she is going to be honest in her listings. And honest might be, that's kind of an ugly word, like I'm implying that other people would be dishonest, but she's not going to try and cover up the fact that the roof is broken or that the foundation needs work or you know whatever. She's going to encourage her sellers to fix that or she's going to list it in, as an issue in the listing. So using an agent who's well-known will just help your house get sold faster. On the other hand, if you don't have a super urgent need to sell, you could go with a newer agent who may have more time to devote to you because they don't have as many clients. With Krista, she's got a lot of clients. She has a team behind her. And I may not be talking to Krista every time I call, which, you know, that isn't a big deal. Krista hired really good people, but... Yes, and that makes total sense because I've sold maybe four houses, I think, in my life. And without the transparency, you're like, wow, you look at the number, oh, I'm paying all this money. And then you don't see what they're doing for you, which is like the experience agent. You may not see what they're doing, but you're getting the benefit of the network and the process they've created over decades necessarily. Yes. And they're not learning how to do it with your house. Right. And, you know, again, it's all about how fast you need to move. The experienced agent already knows what to do when X comes up. There is no such thing as a smooth sale. There's always something weird. And having somebody who's already been through it 15 times, they know who to call to fix the broken foundation, or they can recommend somebody to do this or that, or they know what to do when the financing falls through, which is completely outside of your control. So, you know, using an experienced agent is really the best choice when you need to sell quickly. Okay. And I would imagine too, that there's a difference between knowledge that anybody will have that's qualified and wisdom. I mean, I think like myself, I've been doing what I do 27 years. I think a lot of my value is, wow, I've walked that journey and I've seen it work a million different ways and we don't want to go down that route. Right. (laughs) And the only part of that wisdom, you only learn from seeing screw ups and successes and everything else. Right. Yeah. In my first office, there was this woman who it was without fail. Every property she sold, every property she helped somebody buy, there was this weird issue that had never come up in the history of real estate. And it was every single time. Like, how do you get all these weird properties all the time? But, you know, she's the one you want to go to when you have a question about something because she's done it. She's seen everything. Okay. So I imagine you interview agents. Is there a difference between using an agent and someone's actually a licensed realtor? So the difference between a real estate agent and a realtor is a realtor is a member of the National Association of Realtors. And that's kind of it. Okay. You know, they're a member of the association. They take an ethics class that a regular licensed agent is not going to take because it's not necessary. But that doesn't mean that an agent isn't ethical. That just means they haven't taken the course. Okay. Okay. So let's go to the next step, which is I think A lot of places where people can really add value, the agent and yourself, or not do anything, which is what do you improve to get your house sale ready, right? Ah, This is a great question. And it's, of course, specific house by house. The most important thing is to have a clean house. The most important thing- So let's do it from expensive and inexpensive. So the inexpensive is clean your dang house. Clean your house, get rid of all the stuff. I mean, you're moving. All of your stuff is going with you, presumably. You shouldn't leave it for the next occupant. They don't want it. But you're moving anyway. Get a head start on your packing by just getting rid of things that you don't need, packing up things that you don't need. That's like the best thing to do for a house. When it comes to fixing properties, if something's broken. One thing I think you said in your book, if I recall, was just simple things that don't cost any money, like putting paper down in your cabinets. Yes. Just Just making them look nice. So you want the house to look as big as possible because nobody is like, Ooh, where's the smallest house I could buy? 
So you want it to be spacious. The decluttering is so huge. And that's like the number one thing that everybody recommends because it's so huge. You don't, I've walked into houses and I think to myself, I can't believe you live like this, let alone have this on display for other people to see. But regarding more like fixing things up, if you have a stain, you want to clean it. If you've got something broken, you want to fix it because your buyer is going to make you pay for it anyway. They're either going to reduce their offer. They're going to ask you to pay for it to be fixed before they move in or ask for a credit. So you're going to have to pay for it anyway. If your toilet is broken, fix it. If your kitchen is ugly and you don't want to put in a five, ten, twenty thousand $20,000 kitchen, at least make it look clean. I remember our last house that we sold, it was beautiful as soon as we moved out. (laughs) It had new carpet. Everything I said I was going to fix for years finally got fixed. So a little bit of this is, it's like, I mean, I've been married 27 years, so I don't have a lot of experience in this, but when you go on a date, right? If you're going on a date, it's a new person, you're probably going to put on your nicest shirt. You're probably going to iron it. You're probably going to clean out your car because you want to make a good impression, right? Yes. So people are, when they come through your house, it's like the first date of, could I live here? That's a really excellent, oh, I wish I would have put that in the book. That's a way better way to say it. (laughs) So you want to put your best foot forward. So You do want to put your best foot forward because you never get the second chance to make a first impression. And you walk when someone walks into your house and it smells weird or there's a mess or it's really ugly and outdated. The first thing they think is, oh, this is not what I was expecting. Or, you know, maybe you have provided honest pictures for the property and they are expecting that. They're not coming in saying, oh, I can't wait to pay top dollar for this dump. They're looking for a bargain. The people that buy those houses are the ones that want to buy them cheap because they have a vision and they're willing to do the work. But that's not the normal buyer. That's not the normal buyer. And that's not who you want to be as a seller most likely. I mean, if you're listening to the show, if you're reading this book, you want to get the most money for your house. And to get the most money for your house, you want to have a clean house. You want to have as updated as possible. And updated as possible doesn't mean you have to go and drop $50,000 on a new kitchen. Look around your kitchen. You've got oak cabinets. Oak cabinets are really sturdy. They have fallen out of favor. They're not the preferred wood anymore, but you can make them look better by removing the brass handles and putting a oil rubbed bronze or silver or, you know, brushed nickel or whatever, make it look nicer just by little tiny things. That's a $20 fix. That's, you know, a $50 fix and it still looks better. Take out your faucet that's bright brass and replace that. If it's white, replace it with silver. (laughs) I remember because we've been in our house seven years. When we toured one house, we went into the half bath and it had this fixture in the sink that was like a fish and the water, when you turn the water on, would come out of the fish's mouth. That's probably something I know is the weirdest thing. (laughs) And I mean, that was not the impression that we wanted and we didn't buy that house, but easily replaced. It's easy to be replaced, but it does take time. And a lot of people aren't handy. So if you need a new lighting fixture, I don't want to buy a house that needs all new lighting fixtures because I don't know how to replace a lighting fixture. I actually do. But you know, most people, I'm not your typical buyer. Most people don't want to replace it. They'll have to hire an electrician. Electrician is expensive. A new plumbing fixture, they think they need to hire a new plumber and a plumber is expensive. Just a couple ideas of where you typically spend your money and you get your bang and then where a lot of people spend their money and they don't get their bang. I think if you're moving out and you have an all oak 1980s kitchen, replacing the whole kitchen is not going to get you all your money back. You're going to get some money back but you're not going to get all of it back. So you're actually like losing money when you replace the kitchen. Plus you have to live through a kitchen remodel. So replace the handles if they're really old and ugly. Fix the lighting fixtures. If you have, you know, nine lighting fixtures you need to replace, go out and buy those fixtures. Call up an electrician and have them come over, have them do a one-time service call and they come in, they change them all out. It's really not that hard to change out an electrical fixture. You basically unscrew the old one, match the old wires with the new wires and twist them up in the wire nuts and then you know screw it back onto the ceiling. Okay, There's a little well, bit more. Yeah. Let's make sure we turn the breaker off because I've not done that. Anyway. I'm sorry. Yes. Turn the breaker <laughs> off. I think I flew across the room. <laughs> <laughs> that'll that'll shock you. That'll give you a big wake up. Yes. Yeah, so it's not that hard to do, but it's expensive to replace one if you're using an electrician. It's not that expensive to replace nine if you're using an electrician because they come over once, you show them all the ones that you need to replace, they replace them all, and then you're done. Now I have a friend, so let's move to like staging. 
And because so much is online. I mean, most people are shopping online now for houses. And I have a mm-hmm. buddy here locally, and he actually teaches people. He goes in and does professional photography and even drone stuff because nice. how important it is to have that online experience because to get somebody to go to a house. Is that becoming much more important than just me walking around with my iPhone taking photos? It is. I will not discount the iPhone photo, but you need to take a good iPhone photo. You need to have all the lights on and show it lit up and show it, you know, the actual true perspective of the room. This is something that I do touch on in the book. I hate going to a house and trying to figure out how did they take this picture? This does not look anything like the picture online. There was, there's one house in particular, every time I drive past it, I shake my fist. How could you do that? It was like a four foot tall nook underneath the stairs that the photography made it look like an entire bedroom. And it had a very (laughs) unique wallpaper on the side. So I could recognize that that was the room, but it was so deceptive. The actual house is not going to look different in real life than it actually is. I mean, you can't make the house look like the photos if you take them with a wide angle lens and you lay on the ground and shoot up. So take honest pictures. Because well, and that's a really good point because it goes back to if you don't and you're not building trust, like you go on that first date and all of a sudden you see your date looking at another person, a deceptive photo is sort of like that in that you want to build trust. So anything that doesn't build trust makes you potential exactly. buyer want to go away. Another tip I have is to get the home pre-inspected, which means you hire as the seller, you hire a home inspector to come in and check out the house, especially if you've lived there for a really long time. The roof leaks in that one spot, but I just put a bucket there. It's no big deal. Like you forget about some things that need to be fixed, or you may just not know. Building codes have changed and now you have to have GCFI outlets by all your sinks. If you don't, the home inspector is going to flag that. You want to have the house inspected beforehand. It's four to $600, but then you have the opportunity to fix anything big, fix anything small. And then when you go to list the house, you know, everything's fixed. Your buyer isn't going to go through and be, oh, it needs a new roof. It needs new plumbing. It needs new electrical. It needs all these things. I'm either going to walk away because there's so many problems with the house, or I'm going to ask for a significant discount. Once you have the house pre-inspected, they come in, they have an inspection, they look around, they're like, oh, there's zero things wrong with the house or there's two things. I mean, an inspector's always going to find something, right. but there's two things wrong with the house. I feel more secure in my home choice. I feel you know, better about having the sale go through. Yeah. And one thing I like about your book is that you have lots of stories of, hey, yes. this one time, Paul and Linda went through, I think it was the rental story on that one, but you have lots of stories on every topic. So anybody looking to sell their home, I think your book is a great resource. I want to make sure we touch on two things. Two things. Okay. One is obviously the pricing of your home. And that's where I think a really good realtor is that in the negotiation. Pricing your home correctly based on your need of speed and everything else. Because there are different types of markets. Yes, uh, there are. And in different areas of the country. So let's talk about the different types of markets and how that relates to pricing your home. Okay. So what we're seeing right now across the country is really hot markets. I don't know if you've tried to buy a house in the DFW area lately. The prices are going up. The competition is really stiff. Same with San Francisco, same with New York City. I live in Denver. Denver is really, really hot right now. Every house that comes on the market up to about five or $600,000 is instantly under contract for over asking price with no contingencies, all cash offer, yada, 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 because people want to buy these houses and there's nothing available. Other markets that are seeing a negative population growth, such as Detroit or large areas in the Midwest in general, you're going to see houses that come on the market. They sit for a long time. There's a lot of contingencies on the offers. There's a lot of inspection issues that are more aggressively approached. In my market, uh, somebody might have an inspection just to know what's wrong with the house, but they're certainly not going to ask you to fix anything because you're going to say, no, I'm not fixing anything. I'm just going to take one of the other 17 offers that came in on the property. And then there are really depressed markets, but those are few and far between. Real estate has really picked up in the last few years. You know, The crash of 2008 really harmed real estate for a long time, but it is back up and running the stock market has some uncertainty in it and people are looking towards the get rich quick scheme of being a real estate investor, which is actually not get rich quick. It's get rich slow. 
Yeah. And I think we have similar trends in public markets and real estate of it all seems so easy and then it's really, really not. Yes. So the next topic I want to talk about, I think it's related to this since we are in a seller's market, is the transition, right? So usually the why is we want to get ourselves somewhere else. So we're motivated a lot of times from an emotional standpoint. But then we have this house to sell. And then it's the the age old question, do I buy the new house before I sell the old house? Do I sell the old house in rent and then buy the new house? That is always problematic. That is problematic, especially in this. So most of America is in an upward seller's market where there's more people buying properties than there are properties to buy. So it benefits the seller. We have... In our local market, you see very frequently people will say, I will accept an offer, but I need to rent it back from you until I find a new property. It depends on where you're moving to. If you are selling in a seller's market and staying local, that's going to be more accepted to ask to rent it back because everybody knows you're having a hard time buying. The buyers also know this and they know that if they want to get your property, they have to agree to that. In a seller's market, I would almost recommend you start finding your new house before you put your house on the market because your house will sell almost instantly, especially if you're making it look nice and you're doing what you need to do to get it to sell. Right. And that's where either you buy on your own or having a realtor let you know, hey, we'll probably sell this really quickly Mm -hmm. because you don't want to think that you're going to sell it quickly and all of a sudden you realize you can't. Right. Um, So I get that. So what about, I've had people ask this question. I was like, what if I sell my house and then I just rent for a season either to quote unquote time the market or to just feel more secure that I'm not going to be stuck with two mortgages? What's your experience in that? And is it a generally, hey, that's not a bad idea or what are the risks with that as well? So I think that's a really great idea in a super hot market is to find a place to rent and just rent for a couple of months so you can take your time buying a house. Rent for a couple of months, rent for six months, rent for, you know, rent for a year. You may want to get a month to month lease instead of a full annual lease because if you do find something right away, you don't want to be stuck in a year long lease. Many landlords will have a buyout plan where you will have to pay two months rent or, you know, X dollars to get out of your lease. You know, that's money you don't really want to spend. A month to month lease, I think you have to give like 30 or 60 days notice that you're moving. And you would have that anyway, just with when you get the property, you don't instantly buy the house. You go through and most likely you're getting a mortgage that takes 30, 45, 60 days to get a mortgage through. I think that renting another property is a great idea. You don't have the person who's buying your house constantly asking you, hey, did you find something yet? Are you going to move yet? If you can afford both mortgages, it might be a good idea to buy the other house first and then put your house on the market. Again, if you're in a super hot market, it'll sell really quickly. So it'll be easy to just move out. Yeah. And there's just a disruption because you got to move all your crap a couple of times, right? (laughs) That is not the best. That's not the most fun. But you know, if it's getting the highest dollar for your house, it might be worth it. Yeah. You know, you could put most of your things in storage and just move the bare essentials to the rental place until you find the new place and then move everything. Yeah. Yeah. I think think moving moving is uh, in the top five most stressful things that happen in life is moving. You know, it is. And I have a hard time connecting with that because I have never in my whole life lived in a house for more than five years. So moving isn't a big deal to me, but I can see how it's really stressful for a lot of people. I mean, I'm not an expert. I still have like, I've been in my house for four and a half years and I have boxes that I haven't unpacked yet from four and a half years ago. (laughs) And I imagine you have to keep an open mind because like, if you sell your house first and we're in a seller's market, a lot of times, and this goes to prudent decision-making, a lot of times if it sells quickly, there can be that pressure to find the new house, which can cause you to settle for what you find. I believe I shared a story just like that in my book with Ron and Linda. They had a very bad experience going from a buyer's market where they ended up with two mortgages and they rented out to a tenant that wasn't all that awesome. He was an attorney and he paid his rent on time every month, but he was very demanding and very, he was a very difficult tenant. They finally got rid of that house. They went to move again and they said, well, I'm not going to do this again. I'm going to sell my house first. They rented back from their new 
buyers and then they scrambled. Linda is a very particular person and that's fine. That doesn't make her a bad person. That means she's got very discerning taste. But if you know it's going to take you a long time to buy, you should buy first. Yeah. And that, I think it was in chapter 10 that story was. And you have a lot of great stories that bring a lot of to life. <laughs> so I could talk to you for a long time. I think if you're open, we'll have you on again just to talk about rental real estate. Because I, I would love to talk about rental so, real estate. So we'll get that scheduled. We'll do a whole series on that. But for now, check out their podcast, Bigger Pockets Money, the new one. Yes. You have many podcasts because you have an empire. And <laughs> we will have links to How to Sell Your Home by Mindy Jensen in Six Shot Saturday email, as well as on the website. So you can go check it out. Mindy. Awesome. Love your energy. Thanks. Thank you for having me, Roger. This is a lot of fun. Hey, welcome to the Happy Lab where we noodle on how to live a happier life. Now, before we get to this, Nicole, did you see the news? I know you live here locally. Did you see the news? No, what happened? I don't know what this world is coming to. So yesterday in broad daylight in Dallas, three masked robbers with weapons stole an entire truck filled with five-hour energy. You know those drinks? Oh. Isn't that horrible? Yeah. I don't know how these people can sleep at night. Ha ha, very funny. Good, right? Good, right? Now they're yeah, great, great. And then my daughter, she loves horror movies. And she said there's one that's okay. perfect for me. She thinks I'm a baby boomer. She says there's one perfect for you, Dad. There's this movie where this older couple is haunted by yogurt. That sounds not that scary. It doesn't sound scary, Dad. It's paranormal activia. <laughs> Where are you fighting me? And there's this other movie that she had come out, and it's mildly inappropriate, depending on whether you like body humor or not. It's called Constipation. Have you seen it? You probably haven't because it hasn't come out yet. Roger. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's go set a smart sprint. On your marks, get set. And we're off to set a seven-day baby step to living a awesome life and rocking retirement. So, Nicole, what should we have people do over the next seven days? I think they should go to our Facebook page, and I think they should share some actual funny jokes with us. What? You go to Facebook at, what, facebook.com forward slash retirement answer man, or Twitter, if you're on to Twitter, at Roger underscore Whitney. Yeah, go share some, well, other funny jokes, more funny jokes. Funnier, yes. Hey, Nicole, I just got word from our publisher that the Rock Retirement book is in 75% coverage of all Barnes & Noble stores. That's awesome. He told me it was a big deal. Uh, I haven't looked for it at our local ones, have you? Uh, he says it's 100% within 200 miles, all the Dallas-Fort Worth area. But I think you got to be careful because Ooh. I think they have it in the comedy section. <laughs> <laughs> but that's sort of cool. So if you want to pick up a copy of Rock Retirement and you want to see it in a bookstore in the wild, you can go get it there. Or you can buy the Amazon and you know the Kindle copy, leave a review, and I'll send you a free one. Have a great day. We appreciate you joining us today for this episode of Retirement Answer Man. Be sure to visit rogerwhitney.com slash answers to access the Retirement Answer Library with over 30 checklists to help you make the most of the only life you have. Remember, you have more power than you realize to create an amazing life starting today with Retirement Answer Man. The opinions voiced in this material are for general information only and are not intended to provide specific advice or recommendations for any individual. All performance reference is historical and no guarantee of future results. All indices are unmanaged and may not be invested into directly. Have a wonderful day.